hello out there to everybody. I'm going to give everyone a second to let their audio kick in and get fully logged on uh, before we get going. I'm excited to see uh, all of these participants looking to learn more about data science in the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University. Uh, my name is Ian Richardson. I'm the undergraduate recruitment specialist here at the School of Information Studies or the iSchool at Syracuse University. And again, we're super excited to have you join us. I feel like we're going to have a very interesting and exciting class who is going to be uh, taught by one of our assistant professors, Jasmina Takeva. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Professor Takeva, and she's going to talk about what Snapchat and Walmart have in common. And, and the answer, of course, is data science. So Jasmina, I'm going to make you the host so that you can share your screen. And sounds good. It's all yours. Thank you. All right, everyone. So maybe before, oh, does that mean that I need to let people in? No, I can still. Yeah. All right, all right. I wasn't sure if you have no. access in the waiting room. All right, perfect. Okay, so um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as I'm presenting, but um, I'd like to welcome everybody. I know it's been a long day and maybe before we get started, if you'd like to just um, say where you're joining us from, you could write that in the chat um, as I'm getting ready to start the slideshow here. Um, let's see. Oh, great, Illinois, Hong Kong, oh, wow. Virginia, perfect. Well, I'm originally from Bulgaria. I don't know if um, you know where my country is, but I did my undergrad in the United States and then I did my PhD and, and now I teach at the high school. So what we're gonna be talking about today is what is um, something that Snapchat and Walmart have in common? And as Ian said earlier, one of the answers is data science. So what we have prepared for today um, is the things that you're gonna learn um, after we're done with today's lecture. Um, we're going to be able to answer questions such as what is data? What is data science? Who does data science? Um, and what do these people do exactly? And also why it matters. Um, but before we go there, I'd like to invite everyone to just um, take your phone and point your camera to this QR code on the slide. I hope that everyone can see it. And then um, it's going to take you to a, a poll that has one single question. So all that's required of you is to just enter an answer. Uh, it can be one word. And um, if anyone has already done this, you can see that the question is, what your favorite app is. So I'm really curious to see what everyone enjoys using. And um, I'll give us maybe a minute and then we can take a look at the answers. All right, so let me just see if I can. All right, so can everyone see the word cloud that's starting to form on my screen? If someone can just give me thumbs up or some other reaction. Okay, perfect. So for those of you who um, are looking at the screen right now, uh, and again, we're going to give ourselves a couple more seconds. We have 28 votes so far. Um, folks should feel free to keep voting. Um, but who seems to be the winner so far? Can someone help me decipher this word cloud? Because this is, if you think about it, a source of data, right? So how are we to interpret this data that we see in front of us? What are some of the, yeah, exactly. So we see right in the center, Size here, the font size sort of corresponds to uh, the number of votes that each of these apps um, is receiving. So we can see that the leader so far is Instagram. Um, yep, that's exactly right, Caitlin. And Snapchat and TikTok, I guess, are close seconds. 
Um, all right, so that's very exciting. I can see a lot of Instagram users on here. Um, and that's why, in a way, we chose to call this lecture um, Snapchat and Walmart, because we know how important these apps are as part of our day-to-day uh, -day experience on one hand. And then the next question that I have for you has something to do with this word cloud. So if I go back uh, to my slides, um, I want to point your attention to this next slide over here, uh, which I'm going to, let me see if I can come back in presentation mode. All right, so um, we can all see uh, the logos of some of the major companies on the market so far. Uh, we already saw the word cloud as well um, with um, apps such as Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So what I want us to do is take a couple of seconds again and just think about some things that all of these companies may have in common. Does anything come to mind? And again, feel free to write your answer in the chat. When you think about all of these companies, they come from different industries, right? So industry is not the common denominator here. Yep, that's exactly. So Jack gave us the correct answer. They all operate with lots of data. Now, whether this is data that they themselves generate or that their customers generate and that they have access to, or uh, maybe data that they uh, acquire externally from other sources. But the point is that all of these companies operate with really tons and tons of data. So why is it so important then to talk about data. Here's another question for you. And again, just feel free to point your uh, phone camera to this QR code, and then it will take you to a question that we're going to um, open up and look at uh, in just a few seconds. But I just want to give everyone the chance to um, open it on their phone. All right, maybe a couple more seconds. And then I'll switch over or rather, I will keep it on my screen just so people can still have access to the question. But at the same time, I want to try and access the answers to see, can, um, let me just monitor the chat. Um, everyone has access to this next question, right? And the question is, what comes to mind when we think of the word data? Um, now let's take a brief look at your answers. And again, I apologize. It's a little bit hard for me to access the right tab here with so many pop-up windows, but I think I'm almost there. Yep. Um, all right. All right. So people are saying what comes to mind are things like information, numbers, statistics, Okay, great, yeah. So these are uh, pretty much related concepts. And um, coming back to the slides, let's see why these things are important. How come uh, someone is saying things like hackers too? There's the internet cloud, there's phones, there's Zuckerberg demographics. So in a way, we're going to be touching on each of these in a, you know, sort of a brief fashion tonight, but it's really cool that you guys thought up of these connections because they really do exist and are terribly important. So coming back to the slides, let's see exactly how we can relate all of these concepts. Um, how can we make sense of this word cloud? Um, all right, maybe one way of starting to answer this question is by first defining data. So if we were to think of a definition of data, um, the easiest way to think of data is, data is any fact or value or observation that exists in the world. And that's very important to keep in mind because it's not, we're now in the internet age, there's a lot of sources of data that live online, but that's not, that does not exhaust the full spectrum of data sources. Um, but focusing on online data for this lecture, um, here I have a question for you. And um, I'll take a look at the chat again, because this is where I'll invite you again uh, to write your answer. Um, 
and I'll go uh, one by one through this list and I'm going to be asking you the following. Do you think that each of these items con constitutes uh, a data item? Starting with um, A, a numeric cell in an Excel spreadsheet. Do you think that this represents data? Can we think of this as data? Yep, that's right. So this is um, in a way one data item. Now, how about B? Is a text message data? Yep, that's right. B is also uh, part of uh, what we think of when we talk about data. Now, how about an Instagram post? All right, I see an overwhelming stream of yeses and you are correct again. Uh, uh, an Instagram post can also be considered data. But how about a YouTube video? Can we think of a YouTube video as a form of data? Yep, the answer is yes again. Now, let me ask you uh, the opposite question then. Are any of the things on this list not data? Is there anything on this list that you see which is not a form of data? Yep, that's correct again. So every single thing that you see on this list in a way represents data. Why? Because it fits the description that we gave up here. So it does represent either a fact or a value or an observation about the world, including this last one, which is simply something like um, on November 10th at 7 p.m., um, person X bought a, a carton of eggs from a Walmart or something like that. Even this in itself represents data because it can be um, aggregated with other data points and it can be turned into some useful insights. All right, um, so let's take a look now, um, knowing and sort of keeping in mind the definition of data at this next question, which is asking us if the things that we see, and again, it's the exact same list of items, um, is each of them structured or not? Now, can someone help me out in the chat and try and give us an idea about what we could possibly mean by structured? What, what does structured data look like? Can anyone give me an example? When we say that something is structured, what do we mean? And specifically in the context of data, does anyone have any sort of guesses? Okay, so Oscar says a graph something organized and recorded. Yep, that's a very good um, explanation, Caitlin. Yep, something organized, formatted. Yep, so I'll accept all of these. When we talk about structured data, we mean data which is ready to be analyzed, okay? So you can think of structured data as data which is ready, ready to be operationalized. It's ready to be um, a sort of uh, the subject of mathematical operations. For example, uh, a numerical column in Excel, we can apply uh, a bunch of statistical functions to that column in order to get information out of it, such as what is the mean value or sort of the average, right? The mean and the average, that's the same thing. So we can talk about the average number of likes uh, for uh, Facebook posts and so on. So something that we can neatly store in an Excel spreadsheet and sort of apply mathematical operations to, something that is ready to be analyzed, that's what structured data is. So with that definition in mind, let's uh, go down the list and try and figure out if each of these items is structured or not. So if we think of a numeric cell, so a, a cell in an Excel spreadsheet that contains a number, can we think of this as structured data? Yep, Justin, that's a great answer. Yep, so this is correct. Uh, number A uh, is indeed um, an example of structured data. How about a text message? B. So here people are starting to feel a little less certain. So Brianna says that it is structured. But Finley says no, so who's correct? And for those of you saying no, why do you think that is? Like, why can't we think of a text message as a form of structured data? What's unstructured about it? Any ideas? All right, so let me give you a hint. So a text, exactly, yep, that's right. It's less organized. 
Um, and it doesn't have to have data in it all the time. So if we think of uh, data as numbers, yeah. So not all text messages contain numbers or values and other sort of numerical things like that. But we can still think of the message overall, the text message as a form of data, maybe not in and of itself, but let's say that we have access to a vast number of text messages over time. We can mine these, we can apply, for example, techniques known as text mining to figure out what the overarching topic of conversation is and so on. So while a text message is still very much data, it's not necessarily structured because we cannot take a bunch of text messages and readily apply some analytical tools to them. Like we can't take the average of text, right? So it's not structured. Now, how about an Instagram post? Is an Instagram post, yep, that's correct. Following the same logic, we can't readily take the average of an Instagram post because it's a photo, right, most of the time. Or even if it's just text, the same logic applies as the one that we discussed with B, a text message. It's not ready for analysis just yet. It needs to be pre-processed before we can analyze it further. Now, how about a YouTube video? All right, so Kaylin, that's a great answer. Do companies only depend on structured data? And I believe that I have an answer for you in my next slide. So, but before we get there, yes, I do want to confirm that a YouTube video is also an example of unstructured data. So it is not structured for the same reason that an Instagram post and a text message cannot be considered um, uh, structure, uh, structured data because they need further pre-processing. Now, how about E, a store transaction record? Yup, so now this is in tabular form, right? It's part, it sort of lives in a database already, which means that it has already been pre-processed. There have been some steps prior to it being entered into the database that sort of have made it more tractable and sort of ready to be operationalized and analyzed. So great job, everyone. So we tackled this question successfully. And now let's take a look at sort of a visual representation of what data looks like in the wild, so to speak. Like what do we see when, uh, what a, a data scientist sees when they look, for example, at a web page such as this one. Does anyone know what website this is from? A website where instead of um, star ratings, you get these sort of egg icons. Yeah, so it's very close to Amazon. It's sort of similar. Yep, that's exactly right. Noah gave us the correct answer. It's a website called New Egg, which is sort of kind of like Amazon, but it's geared specifically towards people looking to buy hardware. So it's mainly focused on uh, computer products. Uh, but in every other aspect, it closely resembles Amazon in that it's a sort of platform where you can shop for these things. And just like Amazon, you can leave reviews and you can rate products. And that's exactly what we see here. We see uh, sort of a product that has been rated five out of five, not stars, but eggs. And then we even have stuff like, um, of course, the product name, um, how many um, questions people have asked about it how many answers have been given to these questions, a brief description of the product as well. And then we have sort of a sample of reviews. We have one review that we see displayed here. And so my question now is, can someone help me uh, figure out what in this image could constitute a structured, more or less structured form of data? And you see these sort of orange rectangles here. They just represent different elements, different data points. So can someone give an example of structured, like some part of this page that you believe represents structured data? Price, that's very good, exactly. So price, it's a numerical variable already. So yes, we can readily analyze this. Ratings, that's another good one. Yep, percentages of reviews, that's, yep, so great. So I believe that you, grasp that concept of structured versus unstructured data. But let me ask you this then. Number of reviews, yeah, sample size. That's another great one. Now, time the review was uploaded also, very good. Now, how about on the flip side, if we were to ask about unstructured data, 
what could be an example of that here? Something that we, needs further processing before we can analyze it. Okay, name. Yeah, we can't really compare names in any numerical fashion other than maybe looking at the length of the name or something like that, but we can't get an idea about the content of these variables without further processing. Content of the review, yep, description of the product, pros, pros and cons, that's all great and correct answers. Yep, the review, the product description. Yep, so you got it. Things that we see that contain text here and are not countable, they can be considered as unstructured data. All right, so I think you guys got this. Now let's take a look, coming back to the question that was asked earlier. Um, do companies only rely on structured data? And the answer is overall the data market, which uh, whose representation we see here, um, is showing us that the um, amount of data is growing exponentially uh, over time. And there are different layers of data here. As we can see, enterprise data, or what we can think of as the best representative of structured data, everything that's neatly stored in tabular form, in databases, in spreadsheets, um, that flows between organizations that can be readily analyzed, everything uh, can sort of, or the best representation of that can be found in this bottom layer here. So as we can see, this layer is not where we see the biggest growth um, overall. The next layer um, that's sort of not as uh, prominent, but it's still growing is, does anyone know what VOIP stands for? And let me just access my chat uh, to see. Has anyone heard of this abbreviation before VOIP? Yep, exactly, voice over IP. So what could be an example of that? One example of that is, for example, Skype, right? It's any sort of um, phone conversation that can be um, had online. Okay, so we can see that this sort of layer is also growing. And then another interesting one though, is this green one, which represents social media and web data. So we can see substantial growth over there too, but by far, the layer that is growing uh, at the highest rate, fastest rate, is this um, top layer here, which represents sensor data and devices. Now, we can think of these three layers on top here as sort of jointly representing unstructured data. This is data that is not necessarily always structured. In fact, this is sort of user content that comes to us in the form of unstructured elements like text, like images, like videos, like um, audio files and so on. So this is um, by far the biggest chunk of um, data growth that we observe. It happens in sort of the domain of unstructured data. So to answer the question about whether companies only rely on structured data, by far and increasingly companies have started relying on unstructured data as well. And now when we talk about sensor um, data. What we can say is that um, what can be measured on the internet and what can enter the realm of data is not anymore just what we um, do. Uh, the sort of um, websites that we browse, the buttons online that we click, and so on. It's way deeper than that. Even things that we say can be recorded and stored as data. Does anyone know how this could happen with any type of uh, device, a smart device that um, is under the umbrella of uh, the Internet of Things? What are some devices that can record what we say and then store it in the form of data? Something, yep, so phones, the personal assistant on a phone. Alexa, yep, that's exactly what I was looking for. So things like Siri, like Alexa, like Google Home, um, these um, devices come with sensors that can make use of even things like our speech, right? The things that we say can also be operationalized and stored as data. But it goes even deeper than that. Um, with these, uh, for example, step trackers, 
and other type of activity trackers like that, wearable technologies, um, even the number of steps that we take every day, even this can be represented as data, right? And even deeper than that, um, based on our activities online, companies, big tech companies can assess um, things uh, in, as immaterial as our very thoughts. Uh, so how we feel about things, what we think about, what we dream of, what our aspirations are, even these things can be accessed simply through our online behavior. Um, all the um, tests that you take online, like personality quizzes and all that, uh, the answers that you provide to those can be turned into data, but it goes even deeper than that. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, what happened there is not necessarily that uh, millions of American voters took personality quizzes online. It went deeper than that. Uh, only a fraction of Facebook users did, in fact, take these personality quizzes. And then based on the data that um, developers got from these quizzes, they trained a machine learning model that could relate your psychological traits, your personality traits to your Facebook activities. Like for example, they could say things like people that are more extroverted like pages on Facebook that have to do with sports and with outdoors activities. And so having this model in place, they didn't even need Facebook users to complete these uh, online quizzes to establish what their personality traits were but they could just look at the pages that Facebook users have liked on the platform in order to create sort of a psychological profile of each person. That's something that's known as psychometrics. And this is exactly how companies can access deep layers of our personality. Um, all right. So um, here's another question for you. Who do you think knows you better, Facebook or your friends? And again, it's not a trick question. I just want to see what people think. Uh, we already have an answer. So people think that it's Facebook, even though some of you do believe that your friends know you better. Um, OK, to be perfectly honest with you, it might have been a little bit of a trick question. And how do I mean this? What exactly do I mean by know you? Right? Like, this is a legitimate question because it really depends. So the correct answer here depends on our definition of knowing somebody. What does it mean to say that you know someone? Is it enough to sort of just be able to predict their personality, like th whether they're more outgoing or whether they're more introverted and so on? Like, is that enough to say that you know somebody or do we mean that you know their, let's say, deepest secrets, or you've known them for years since they were a child, and so on? So I am referring here to the first more superficial definition of knowing someone, knowing in the sense of being able to predict their future behavior. And so with that definition in mind, in terms of data, correct. Yes, Amira, Facebook in that case would know us better. Now, how does that work? There is a very controversial um, social experiment that Facebook performed um, a few years ago. And uh, Facebook developers were able to find out that it didn't really take all that much data uh, from an individual Facebook user to be able to predict their behavior. And how this works is really scary uh, if you think about it, because they found, for example, that based on just 10 of your likes on Facebook. So just by having access to about 10 of the pages or groups that you have liked on Facebook, they could predict more accurately your behavior um, than a classmate of yours. And with something like 70 likes, this prediction could be more accurate than most of your friends. And when we increase the number of likes to about 300, then they were able to sort of predict your behavior better than even your romantic partner. So that just goes to show how powerful the sort of data breadcrumbs that we leave on that we leave online with our online behavior, how they can be um, aggregated and analyzed in a way to create these powerful models that can really um, get to um, predict things about us. Um, in a very detailed and scarily accurate way. 
Um, that's why many experts today say that uh, the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. And the reason data is so powerful is precisely because when uh, companies have access to large amounts of data, now don't think of it just in terms of an individual user. Uh, my data in and of itself may not be very helpful to companies like Facebook. But uh, the power of Facebook stems from the fact that they have access to the data, not just of me, but of millions of other users like me. And basically by combining all our data together, they're able, by having access to all this data, they're able to create these powerful algorithms that can really tell us a lot about uh, society. Now, does anyone know what this logo in the lower right-hand corner here is? Have you seen this before? It looks like a warped uh, infinity symbol. Meta, exactly. So what is meta? It's sort of the rebranded um, company behind Facebook now, exactly. So Facebook does have access to really an unprecedented amount of our personal data. And we're going to be talking about how exactly this uh, constitutes its power, but also its responsibility in a little bit. But before we go there, I guess the next question in order is, who creates these powerful models that can predict your personality better than your family? Does anyone have any idea what do we call these people that are behind these algorithms, behind these models? Data analysts or data scientists? Which one is it? And the answer to this, so it's, it's a good question of what the difference is between a data analyst and a data scientist. Does anyone know? Yes, so the correct answer here is data scientists. Uh, but what is the difference between a data scientist and a data analyst? Okay, so let me show you the definition of a data scientist. So a data scientist is involved in all of these activities that you see on here. So they can code, they can pre-process data, they can visualize data, they can apply machine learning techniques to data, they can present their findings uh, to other stakeholders, and they also know things about ethics, um, ideally, hopefully. Um, exactly, so Sam gave us a great answer. Analysts interpret the data, data scientists sort of either create or create the models for. So data analysts most of the time take data that already exists and they don't really participate in the creation of the algorithms that can analyze that data. Um, that's more in the purview of data scientists themselves. So data scientists are people that are involved in, according to the technical definition of data science here, they um, have very particular and deep domain knowledge. They also know math and statistics. They are well versed in computer science and they're good communicators. This is a technical definition of data science, but the practical definition by the person who coined the term data science, DJ Patel, who you see here. So he's the one that gets credited with introducing the idea of data science into the mainstream. And so he believes that data science can most broadly be defined as anything that uses data in novel ways to build things. So as Sam told us in the chat, uh, while data analysts analyze data and don't necessarily create things out of it, um, other than you know, uh, an analysis, when it comes to data scientists, they create algorithms that can further operationalize and sort of um, leverage that data. Okay. Now let's talk briefly about some common misconceptions about data science. And this one I hear a lot. And I started with this one because this is where people usually give up when no matter how much they uh, are interested in data science, when they hear the word math or computer science, they sort of get scared and they think that data science is not for them. But I would like to tell you all that it's wrong that you must be a math or computer science quiz in order to be a good data scientist. And the reason why it's wrong is because data science and sort of the expertise that data scientists have looks more like a T 
It's a T-shaped type of a thing of the kind that you see here. And what I mean by that is, yes, you do need to be aware of certain data science principles. You do need to be aware of certain statistical principles, but really the core of it is your own domain sort of um, area of expertise, which does not necessarily have to be data science. Uh, it can be, for example, journalism. You may be really interested in journalism and you can be uh, a data science journalist, by which I mean journalists that use uh, data that they find online or that they uh, compile themselves. And then they create powerful machine learning algorithms in order to analyze it and to write new stories about it. Um, but again, really the depth here comes from their domain knowledge in journalism and not so much from math or computer science. Now, a, a second uh, common misconception about data science is that it's just a fad, it won't last, last long, we're sort of past the peak already. And I want to emphasize that this is wrong as well because there are many projections by market experts that say that in the next few years, there's gonna be a shortage of 250,000 data scientists in the United States alone. So just think about uh, the scale of this. And the reason why there is, or the market for data scientists keeps expanding is because of the graph that I showed you earlier, this exponential growth of data. Well, guess what? As data is growing, so does the need for people to analyze it and to create models to help that analysis, right? So we naturally see uh, more and more need for data scientists um, in the current economy. And then the third misconception uh, has to do with um, sort of the idea that artificial intelligence would somehow replace data scientists. So basically the algorithms will replace uh, humans. Now, this is also wrong, and it's wrong because of where we stand with regards to the singularity. Does anyone here know what the singularity is? Have you ever heard of this term before, the technological singularity? If you've seen any sci-fi movies um, like Ex Machina and so on, like the idea of the singularity is that moment in time when the machines will take over where um, technological advances will be so powerful that they cannot be stopped or reversed anymore. Um, so this is the idea that there is gonna be a point in time when machines are going to become more powerful, more intelligent than humans, and they will take over the world and they will enslave us or any other thing like that. But what I um, wanna emphasize, exactly, AI surpasses human intelligence. That's exactly what we mean by the singularity. And what I wanna say is um, because we're nowhere near um, approaching this moment of the singularity, no one needs to worry about the fact that artificial intelligence will take over the work of data scientists. Why? Because no matter how um, advanced algorithms are today, they are still advanced in sort of a very finite set of um, problems that they can solve which is called narrow AI. So each algorithm can solve a very particular set of problems. Like Siri, for example, can understand voice commands. That's what Siri is good at. But Siri cannot cook, right? Siri cannot do the dishes. Um, similarly, the algorithms that um, Cambridge Analytica used to predict um, our personality were very powerful in term terms of predicting our personality, but they could not, for example, predict stuff like how many steps you did today, all right? So what we mean by narrow AI is that we have algorithms that are trained to accomplish a very specific narrow set of tasks. Um, and for the singularity to occur, we need to have general AI. We need to have robots or algorithms, um, cyborgs that are capable of performing all of these things that humans can, that can read and hear and speak and walk and do all of these things. But we're very far from approaching this. So there is no need to worry that um, AI will take over the work of data scientists because there's no AI at this point that can make better judgments about very complex questions um, than the human mind. And what I mean by this is algorithms are terrific when it comes to answering questions such as what's in the data, sort of the descriptive nature of things. What is this data telling us? 
algorithms can help us a lot with that, but the algorithms cannot answer a more pivotal question, which is why do we observe these things in our data? Okay, so artificial intelligence cannot explain why something is occurring. It can just point out to us that it is in fact occurring, but not explain why. So we're near the end of my presentation, but I wanted to sort of demonstrate to you some exciting new developments in data science. Has anyone heard of computer dreaming or deep dreaming before? I'll show you, okay. So some of you have already heard of this, but I will show to all of us what exactly this is. And it's based on something, um, a sort of a branch of artificial intelligence and data science that we call computer vision. So let me just demonstrate to you in about 30 seconds what exactly computer vision is. All right, so I hope everyone can see my screen. And I want you to pay close attention to the faces of these people. Does anyone remember that show? Has, yep, exactly, it's friends. So let me just play it again, just in case you didn't catch that. But did you notice anything sort of out of the ordinary? Yep, that's exactly right. So if you pay close attention to their faces, you will see that it's actually the exact same face on, yep, so Monica definitely looks different because it's not Monica, but in fact, Nicolas Cage, yep. So all of them have <laughs> the face of Nicolas Cage. So isn't that interesting? So how exactly can we accomplish that? It's not Photoshop, right? Photoshop works for um, sort of static images, but this is an entire video of people that are moving, right? They're moving around, they're saying stuff, and yet it's very believable that they all have the same face and it's the face of Nick Cage transposed on all of their faces. So the technology that makes this possible is called computer vision. Yep. so the apps that people have heard of that are capable of these things, they operate on this principle of computer vision, which is the branch of data science that teaches, quote unquote, algorithms how to see things, how to detect, in this case, faces. So basically what the algorithm is doing is, first it's mapping all the faces of the people that are in the frame. And then it sort of um, cuts out the actual face and it superimposes Nick Cage's face on top of it. But for the algorithm to be able to do that, first of all, it needs to be taught how to recognize what a face is. Um, and then based on the same idea, uh, we have uh, something called computer dreaming or deep dreaming that was developed by Google. And I apologize for uh, the ads, but we'll be able to see the video or sort of an example of computer vision in just a second. And this is what computer vision can do. So it's um, an art form almost uh, of taking uh, an exorbitant amount of data and visualizing this data in interesting ways. Um, and so here as well, uh, we have the advances of data science in the sense of computer vision and artificial neural networks being able to create um, something that looks very much like art. Um, and what I want to mention is that if you follow this link that I'm going to uh, drop in the chat, um, it's called Deep Dream Generator dot com. Uh, you should be able to create your own um, sort of artwork based on uh, machine learning. It does require a, a Google account though. So if you don't have a Gmail account, uh, you can create one and use it. Um, and then you can sort of create your own art based on artificial intelligence without any need for coding or anything like that. So these are just a couple of the interesting developments in the field, but I want to conclude by showing you this slide. Does anyone know who this is? Have you seen her before? Or maybe heard of the story? Does anyone know why she's holding a white mask? So does anyone remember her name? 
Yep, so exactly. So this is one of the leaders in uh, the movement for social justice when it comes to AI. Yep, so there are many documentaries that feature her work. Her name is Joy Bulon Vini, and she's at MIT. And as a PhD student there, she discovered that a face recognition app could not recognize her face. It had no problem recognizing, sort of mapping, detecting the face of her white colleagues. But when it came to her face, the algorithm simply could not detect it. She even found out that if she was wearing this white mask, the algorithm could still detect the face, but could not detect her own face. And this is when she started really researching deeply how um, bias occurs in algorithmic systems. So what I wanna say about this is that um, computer science programs are really great um, at teaching students how to create algorithms. Business programs are really great at taking these algorithms developed by computer scientists and applying them to sort of enhance uh, the bottom line of companies. But what we at the iSchool are great at is going beyond these two domains and also talking about the social implications of algorithms, okay? And this is something that you don't get to hear about in regular computer science programs. But we do have entire courses that are focused on examining sort of the positive, but also the negative effects of algorithms and how we can improve those and how we can create a better future for everyone, especially marginalized communities. Um, so the last thing that I want to do is reintroduce you to this question. I know that you've seen it before, but I just wanna check if this lecture helped you think about data in, in a different way. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And yes, it is a great documentary. There are other documentaries like that. I can provide you with some more uh, resources if you're interested in um, sort of this discussion of the social impact of AI. Um, yep, okay, so I can do that. Another good one is The Great Hack. I don't know if people have heard about it. It was also on uh, Netflix at least um, last month. Okay, yeah, so that's another good one. The coded gaze is another one, um, or coded bias, I believe. But at any rate, I'll create a list for all of you who are interested in this topic. All right, so let's, I will just take a brief look at the answers and then we'll open it up for questions. All right, so we have future, valuable, statistics, personal interests. Yeah, so what I hope to also spark is sort of this discussion around ethics and justice. Um, and we can talk about it more in the Q&A session. So this is all I have for you for tonight. And now I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll pass it back on to Ian. Wow, thanks a lot, Jasmine. That was a very interesting look at, at data science as a whole, but really how it's utilized not only in, in businesses, but, but across all different types of, of uh, uh, applications and, and how our students can kind of see themselves moving forward in that. It was very interesting. I wanna thank you very much for taking time this evening to share all of that information with us. Um, with the 10 minutes or so that we have left, we'd like to open it up for any questions uh, that people have. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat. Um, Jasmina can, can read them and, and answer them, or if you'd like to raise your hand and, and uh, say your question over the microphone and, and uh, even uh, your camera, that would be fine as well. And again, thank you, Jasmina, for sharing everything with us tonight. And, uh, and feel free to ask any questions that you have. I see a lot of thank yous, which is <laughs> nice. I will say this, this um, session has been recorded. So I'm putting my email address into the chat right now. If you're interested in re-watching this recording or if you have questions for Jasmina that you'd like me to pass along, um, we can answer them that way. I did see a question go by real quick in the chat. If I can find that. Do you have majors dedicated to the analyst side of data science? As a matter of fact, new this fall, 
we have a, a new major at the I school called Applied Data Analytics, which would allow students to explore these cutting edge concepts like machine learning and artificial intelligence. You will take a deeper dive into coding on that. So as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact we do have a new major that's designed uh, just for that. Well, with data analytics oh, as well, is it offered as a minor? So we do also offer data analytics as a minor. That uh, would be really reserved for students outside of the iSchool because of the majors we offer. There's a lot of overlap uh, and you wouldn't major and minor in the, in the same thing, but we do offer data analytics as a minor at the iSchool. Are there any questions for, for Jasmina before the uh, session ends about uh, the, the presentation that you saw tonight? If I were to major in DJ and wanted to do a dual major with DA, uh, can you just describe to me what BDJ means? Digital journalism, I would imagine, is what you're saying? Maybe. So uh, if you were to major in, in digital journalism and wanted to do a dual major, what would be a good major to study uh, that would help you? So we do actually offer dual degree programs with SI Newhouse School of Public Communications where you would pick um, any major at the iSchool and any major at, at Newhouse. Um, and, and that's more of a streamlined process for students. Um, and you probably would major in, in whatever technical aspect you kind of saw yourself drawn to here at the iSchool. Um, given this, topic, I would imagine that applied data analytics would be uh, a good fit for you. But but Sam, I'm happy to connect with you individually and discuss how that program works and, and discuss all of our majors. If you'd like, feel free to send me an email at your convenience and we can set up a time to talk about those programs more in depth. So Jasmine, maybe this is one you can answer. Someone had asked where you could sure. work after getting a degree in data science. So there is no one way to answer this question, but what I could say is that I have tremendous hope in the future, in your generation, really, and uh, your interests. And I believe that since so many of you have already seen Coded Bias and other movies and documentaries like The Social Dilemma and all that, and ethics is something that you do consider important, I see nothing but sort of uh, optimism uh, in the field right now and a lot of energy around um, data ethics, um, data justice, and so on. There's a lot of work that's being done in this domain right now. And I believe that um, with all of this, with a collective effort, the field will be tremendously improved when it comes to uh, protecting our privacy um, and so on. But if this is the kinds of improvements that you were asking about, of course, if you mean um, on the tech side, I believe that we see improvements every day almost. So um, algorithms and their power really increase exponentially. And so every year there's a more powerful tool that's out there. But what I wanna emphasize is that what the iSchool can give you is not just sort of a state of the art overview of what's available in the field right now, but also equip you with the analytical tools and the critical thinking skills to keep up with these advancements um as they keep developing and entering the market I hope that um, in in reference to the the question about where students could find themselves working uh with a degree that focused on data science or data analytics I, I, correct me if i'm wrong jasmina but but honestly there there aren't any fields that aren't utilizing these skills correct. so um mm -hmm. at currently at the i school we have um, a 90% placement average. That's our three-year rolling average. We were 88%. We had an 88% placement rate uh, during a pandemic last year, which, which is to say that last year, 88% of our graduates went on uh, to find employment within six months of graduation. The reason we're able to have such success for our graduates uh, when it comes to job placement is that we're not sending students, we're not sending graduates to one or two fields we send graduates to every field, right? Every industry utilizes these skills. So as far as career outcomes are concerned, you really have the opportunity to pursue uh, fields that are you're passionate about or that you're very interested in. With the few minutes that we do have left, I, I wanna encourage you to ask any last minute questions you have, but again, you can send those questions to me. Um, 
I can curate them and send them to Jasmina and have her uh, answer them uh, and we can get them back to you. Uh, do you think having a minor in data analytics is useful to those interested in business as well? Um, I would say that it it's certainly a very good idea. And that's kind of a combination that you'll see a lot of students from, from Whitman School of Management, the business school at Syracuse University, will often major in that data analytics here at the I or minor in data analytics here at the I school, uh, because it does complement that that's curriculum so well and it offers kind of an added skill set to those students that are looking to enter the, the classic business roles for organizations. Uh, that's a very common combination as a matter of fact. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your evening to join us uh, and to listen to this presentation and I want to invite all of you to check our events page which I had listed uh, earlier in the chat, it's it's at at, uh, at our website where you can find all of our upcoming events, including information sessions and other events uh, designed to give you a better idea at the curriculum and the programs that we have here at the iSchool. As I said before, you can reach out to me directly and I'm happy to help you uh, find the resources that you're looking for or get any of the questions that you have answered. I want to thank Professor uh, Assistant Professor Jasmina Takeva again. It was very interesting. I'm very excited to have these opportunities uh, to show off our faculty and the uh, incredible work that they're doing. So thank you very much. I'm very grateful for, for you sharing your evening with us as well. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you everyone for being such a great audience. And I really uh, am really pleasantly, pleasantly surprised at how active you were and the, all the great answers that you were giving me. And so I would just like to put my email in the chat um, too. Uh, in case you have questions, feel free to reach out to me as well. And I hope to see you at the iSchool soon.